Well, welcome everyone. We're really pleased you're joining us. I'm Frank Fuhr, and you're gonna meet three of my colleagues in a few seconds. And we're pleased you're taking the time to be with us today uh, to reflect on her recent experience, I'm laughing, because none of us ever expected to have the experience that we had collectively. That sounds mysterious. Uh, in a way it is, and we'll talk more about it, what it is and what we experienced in a few minutes and our thoughts about it. Um, but uh, before we do that, what I wanna do now is turn to my colleagues so you can get a sense of who they are. And then I'll come back and talk more about uh, the experience we had collectively, uh, how it came to be. And then we'll have a conversation about not only the experience, it's a political experience, but uh, our thoughts about the broader political situation. And we're gonna start with Melanie. Why don't you let the audience know who you are? I'm Melanie Mack. I live in DeWitt, Michigan. I have always been someone very, very interested in history and politics. I'm a lifelong Democrat and I'm very concerned about the way things are going in today's world. Very good. Jason, you're up. Hi, my name is Tassan Sardar. I live in East Lansing, Michigan with my wife and two boys. Uh, I work uh, in the field of information technology at the state of Michigan. Um, I, I try to actively advocate uh, civic engagement in my communities. And I also volunteer with a couple other organizations locally here in the greater Lansing area. Um, so for me, it's about trying to uh, serve the community and uplift the community in whatever ways I can. Uh, happy to be part of uh, uh, political discourse to see what's best for our communities. Excellent. Terry. Um, I'm Terry Link. I live in Langsburg, Michigan with my wife, Ellen, and we've lived here for almost 40 years. I've uh, been involved in this community quite a bit. I've served as an elected official as a county commissioner. I've run for office a few times, uh, both as an independent, as a Green Party candidate, and as a Democrat. So my politics are left of center. Uh, not ashamed to say that, uh, but like Toss and Melanie and Frank, uh, I believe that there's better ways to do things and uh, more collectively. So uh, always pleased to be engaged in these kind of conversations. And thanks to Frank for putting this together. Well, thank you all. Uh, they're really good people. Uh, I can tell you that. Uh, I'm very committed to politically uh, and uh, certainly in terms of working for the greater good. So I'm a better person for having known these three. Uh, but let's talk about what we did together, uh, because I think it's it's really, for us, it was fascinating, and I think it would be fascinating for anyone. Uh, by the way, I'm Frank Fear, Professor Emeritus, Michigan State University. I uh, live part of the year in uh, Central Michigan uh, and part of the year in Florida, where I am right now. We're taping this about a week after the Iowa caucus, uh, but we're going to talk about an experience we had collectively in October of 2023, and here it is. Um, one of the tasks that uh, I'm involved in in retirement, Professor Emeritus, among many, uh, is to manage a Facebook uh, page uh, that is for, it's entitled, Michigan Independent Voters. Uh, and that, uh, that Facebook page is affiliated with a national organization called independentvoting.org, uh, which is a very important organization. I've been affiliated with it for about 10 years now. Uh, that is an advocacy organization, not just for independence, uh, because there are obviously millions around the country, but also in terms of political reforms like open primaries that uh, support, promote uh, democracy. So I'm very, very pleased to be involved with that. So on that Facebook uh, group, the one that I co-manage, uh, one of my tasks is to respond to inquiries, new memberships, comments, whatever. Uh, as any Facebook uh, administrator does. One day in October, early October, uh, I received a very, we received a very unusual request of post from, an, from a producer of a media organization in Great Britain called ITV. Now ITV is the largest private uh, media corporation, television, uh, and also a variety of other media pursuits, uh, films, for example. Uh, that they were going to have a, a crew come to Michigan and they, and they wanted to engage um, voters, especially voters um, who were um, independent, nonpartisan is the way they put it, uh, which we are to a certain extent, you heard the introductions. Uh, but, uh, but still, they said, would you 
help us assemble a group uh, to interview. And it had to be on a fast track because the crew was coming in in about three or four days after that. But, you know, those of us with media experience know that's not unusual. You have to move uh, quickly. Anyway, we did. So I reached out to New York where independentvoting.org is. And also I reached out to Terry. We've known each other for probably 30, 40 years probably now. And uh, asked him to give me the names of colleagues. Uh, the, the folks you've seen and been introduced to today are the ones that eventually participated in, in the event. So um, I would also say that, that uh, the uh, experience we had here, I think, was the first for all of us. And that is to be interviewed by an uh, international organization, in this case, from Great Britain. ITV uh, is the largest, as I mentioned, the largest private media group. It would be equivalent to NBC, ABC, CBS here. Uh, and just like we have PBS on the public side here, they have BBC. So ITV and BBC are two of the largest and most prominent media producers uh, uh, in Great Britain. And one of the things that they both do, uh, just like PBS does, uh, and the major networks, private networks here, is they follow politics. And so uh, ITV, uh, with award-winning uh, journalist Robert Moore, has done a number of these programs uh, that focuses on politics. And of course, what's happening in the U.S. is very important to Great Britain for a variety of reasons. And so uh, they've been following what's been happening, not just in the 24 election, but years earlier. And Robert Moore had a film, he was a member of the film crew here uh, on January 6th. So they follow U.S. politics uh, very, very well. So uh, that's basically the setup. We had an opportunity to meet with the film crew uh, in, uh, in, in actually at Terry's home uh, in Michigan, in central Michigan. Uh, we didn't know then what the title of this documentary was going to be. The title is Trump colon the return question mark. Uh, in other words, will he return? We didn't know that exactly at the time. And even though we've seen producers cut of the full hour documentary, which includes not only us, but uh, but uh, people who were interviewed during their tour of the US, it includes Chicago, um, Tennessee, a variety of other places, Washington, DC. So Michigan wasn't the only um, place identified to uh, contribute and we weren't the only folks uh, in the documentary. In fact, we're probably five minutes of an hour long uh, documentary. But that provides you the the uh, the background to the experience that we had collectively. So let's move into uh, the discussion about uh, your, your thoughts about um, the documentary as you saw it. You can start with your thoughts about the political situation generally. Anywhere you want, anything you want to say uh, in relationship to not only our shared experience, but your interpretation of it. And also your thinking now with respect to uh, with respect to the election and the circumstances in the U.S. writ large. And so let's just open it up. So the experience I, I was very positive for me. I enjoyed meeting Robert and the cameraman. I thought they were charming people. I, I enjoyed the conversation with the three of you. It was lively and interesting. My comments were all edited out. Um, and I think that was because I was quite positive about Joe Biden. And when we watched the video, um, my husband watched it with me. He would not watch the whole thing. He actually was quite disgusted with it. He said, this is the most one-sided, biased, slanted thing that I've ever seen, and I'm not watching anymore. And, and he wouldn't. I watched the whole thing. But I tend to agree. I really, um, I really don't like the picture that was painted. And Robert did not press back on places where he should have pressed back. I'm thinking specifically of that factory worker from Youngstown, Ohio, when he was ticking off the things. Trump listens to us. Trump cares about us and all the policies that Trump's done that helped them. And the policies are things that Biden's done. And everybody knows Trump doesn't care about anybody but himself. And Robert just let that rip. He never pressed back. So I actually was very, very, very disappointed with the film that resulted from uh, Robert's effort. Uh, I was personally um, surprised by the title, uh, but I should not be surprised because that was the intent, I think, of the whole project. 
uh, that the threat is really looming out here. And from that, in that sense, the title appears to be appropriate. Um, but the other takeaway for me, uh, which kind of left me a little uh, perplexed, was the fact that I'm in a documentary where there are two infamous personalities that were interviewed, uh, Rudy Giuliani and uh, Dinesh D'Souza. Uh, I just find myself in bad company in a documentary here. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. how I felt at the end. Terry, your thoughts? Oh, well, kind of a, a blend of what you've already heard from Melanie and, and Tassin, I think, so far. Uh, one, I was very depressed. After after watching it, the the, the picture it painted was much darker uh, than I wanted to believe, uh, and I, I I realized there's some things in there that I wasn't aware of that probably I should be aware of. Uh, some of those really really crazy right wing uh, folks and the and the sheer numbers of people that turn out to those events um, that's a little bit scary. Uh, the process itself. Uh, I couldn't help but wonder from the moment we finished, giving all that all the filming they did, they were there for an hour or a little plus. Uh, you know, how much of our conversation was actually going to make the the final cut? So we knew, obviously, you know that they were going to take bits and pieces, but I had no idea how they were going to assemble it. So I was disheartened that none of Melanie's uh, thoughts got in there. Um, you know, I, d I don't know the reason particularly. You could, I could see it as gender bias potentially, but. I don't know. I can't get in the heads of the of the editors, um, but um, and, and Melanie might might be might be right on, on on that assessment. I guess the the other thing that was interesting that maybe as I as I sit on it now, having watched it, uh, at the end we see that Robert was himself uh, involved and threatened during the January sixth uh, uh, insurrection at the Capitol. So it, it was a personal story for him as well, something I would not have uh, anticipated uh, in that. And so I think he, he might take it in a way, uh, the, the, the whole issue a little differently than, than uh, had he not been so involved in, in the whole thing. So um, that, that put a little context in there for me. I mean, I was, I was always concerned that my my comments, if they got in there, uh, would not be shown as complex as they were. So, if, for for example, there was uh, a quote that's in there for me about how we had two terrible choices. But I also made the statement that, you know, <clears throat> when it came down to it, if it was between the two, it wasn't a big issue for me who I was going to vote for, as disappointed as I am in many things about Joe Biden. Um, but, of course, that, did, that didn't make it. Um, and, you know, by the any editor is going to have to make all kinds of choices. And after they get everything together, I don't know how much was intentional at the front end or how much it was shaped by the whole process of them collecting all those pieces and putting it together. Hmm. Uh, all good points. Uh, Melanie, uh, when we watched it, we, the Fear household, Kathy Fear and I, watched it together. Uh, her response, I think, is very similar to, was very similar to your husband's. Um, and I think the other thing that struck me is, uh, and that is every time you turn on the television or pick up a newspaper or go online and someone is expressing themselves, they're making choices about what they're saying, how they're saying it, and why they're saying it. For me, the bottom line is this is the way it is. It always is. Every time I write a commentary, uh, you're learning about as much about me as what it is that I'm writing about. And that's not uh, that's not uh, unusual. In fact, and I would even further say, one of the things I try to do anytime I watch a film, anytime I read a book, anytime I do consume anything, is I try to find background uh, on the source. So, for example, with a film, I'll try to find about information on the screenwriter and the producer so I have a better idea I can interpret the content better. Sometimes I'm surprised, sometimes I'm not. But I did go back and look at ITV uh, documentaries. And I would say that, again, it's a private operation. Uh, and so it's corporate. Uh, but there is a very, a stream, a pattern through the documentaries I watch is an abiding concern 
that who is president of the United States has tremendous implications, not just for you, America, but for us uh, around the world. And there is a, uh, in a way, I think if I had to label it, and I'm only speaking for myself, I would say the video is a cautionary tale. It's basically saying here is what's going on in America um, and what, what could happen if Donald Trump uh, returns to the White House uh, at, in, uh, in 2025. Uh, and from that perspective, I would conclude that that is very real. It's a very real threat. And I'm, I said to myself, if I were producing this in Britain, what approach, what theme, what perspective might I take? Um, and uh, again, it's me. It would be, uh, this could be a, a disaster, not just for the United States, but for the world. Uh, because um, fascism, anarchy, uh, and other isms that you want to attach to it could become, uh, not only could infect the mainstream, but could be the drive, driving force with respect to Americans, American national policy, our institution. I think you described it really well, Frank, and I completely agree and do have to constantly be reminded that you're getting uh, a story filtered through the experiences of whoever is telling it. But I think the thing that is striking me with this film and with with things broadly reading the the newspapers and stuff too is that there's a picture being painted that that Trump is inevitable and we're not pushing back against against that. There's a really jaundiced picture coming up and uh, you know, just just for an example, the, the Iowa caucuses, it was very few people who voted there. I think it was something on the lines of 110,000 or something like that. And Trump got 51 percent. But but between the DeSantis and, and Haley, of course, DeSantis is history now got 49. But everything I read is a stupendous win in Iowa. That's bullshit. It just is. And the, 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 we need to push back against the way that this is getting portrayed because, I mean, I'm probably better informed than most voters and I'm getting really discouraged. There's days I wish I could just sit around and just, you know, like pull down the shades and, and let the world go by. And if I'm having that reaction, I cannot even begin to imagine what people who who just have to be totally disgusted with what they're hearing. He has cre created that aura around himself that he is invincible, uh, and sadly, the Republican Party succumbed to it, and so does the media, unfortunately, to Melanie's point. Uh, everyone's beating the same drums at this time. It's too late for Nikki Haley to be speaking out now against Trump. She had all these months to speak out more vocally against him, but it's in the last couple of days, uh, I think she is speaking out more against him, because now that it's going to be just him and her pretty much um, it didn't have to wait this long so basically i was just getting to the point uh, melanie was making that he created this invincible aura around him did not take part in any of the debates we'll see what the next caucus brings i remain depressed um for for a variety of the reasons because of the possibility that the the film shows of what really it could look really uglier than we anticipate, but also the fact that every time Donald Trump opens his mouth, uh, cameras are there and broadcasting it regardless of the stupidness that he has to say. And even though, as I was telling my beloved just the other day when this came up, that you know, at least now once in a while they call out his lies, uh, and usually in very polite ways, they don't say lies, they say there's no facts to support what he has just said. Uh, and um, so there, there is a, a there is a progression here. You know, we have how many more months? Now? Nine more months for the election. Ten more. Uh, so a lot can happen in that time frame, which is still my hope uh, that there will be things beyond our individual control uh, that we should be hopefully prepared and ready to run with. That might provide some avenues to make what is being painted as inevitable not inevitable. But that remains to be seen what those are. I'm, I'm quite confused. It goes back to something that Melanie said, the inevitability. And what I'm hearing on both sides, and I think this is one of the things that if there is a benefit, 
about being an independent. You're not of either. Uh, and so uh, you, you basically receive information unfiltered because you're not of a party. Is that, that it's inevitable that Trump will win and it's inevitable that Biden will win. And what's interesting, well, not interesting, what I find uh, most, more concerning to me are those who um, support Biden and his platforms, Democrats and others, uh, when they say that. Because if you believe something is inevitable, I, I think sometimes you're less likely to engage in the kind of activism that is need to, to, to make sure that's a certainty. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of activism around. I mean, I, I live in Lee County and the Democratic Party here is very active. And I know of Lee County, Florida. And I know a lot of folks who are spending enormous amounts of time, get out the vote, et cetera, et cetera. But there's still that theme there, um, the, you know, the ever-present inevitability. You know, a, a colleague of mine just said the other day, uh, and th there's a counter to this, uh, and there's literature to support it. And there's a counter to this in the documentary, and there's literature to support it about the issue of these indictments and whether or not uh, Joe, whether or not uh, Joe Biden, whether or not Donald Trump will be convicted. Uh, and a really good friend of mine said, "Well, once if he's convicted, that's the end of it. Uh, people will see him for what he is." And um, you know his his odds of becoming president will be reduced significantly. But there's literature that supports that those indictments and the possibility of conviction are working in Donald Trump's uh, behalf. That it's almost like, in fact, even in the documentary, I'll say this: uh, the, I think we saw a scene where it said, "We you know one more conviction, one more, one more wasn't that right?" Mm -hmm. And it's scary, and it and and and. Uh, uh, and I, I'm really worried, not about those who support uh, Biden, but though, excuse me, Trump, but those who support Joe Biden, when they talk about everything will be fine. Uh, once these trials go on, people will see for what he is. Uh, and if anything, I see that for that, it's not just the base anymore. I think uh, the, 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 the routine that we've heard, he can't possibly be elected because his base is only 25 to 30 percent. My my perspective, and I would like to get your reaction to this, I don't think we can talk in base terms anymore. Um, that I think we have to go beyond that base. You know, we're the day before the New Hampshire election, and in New Hampshire, the majority of registered uh, uh, voters are independents, uh, and um, they're free agents. Uh, there are more independents than either Democrats or Republicans. So this issue of the base to me seems to be uh, a distraction, maybe even a red hair. But your thoughts? Um, to Robert's credit, in the film itself, uh, in the documentary, he covered all the areas where, uh, I know you alluded to just the 25% support that he has, but Robert touched all those points, areas where he's trying to build his base upon, um, be it immigration, uh, illegal immigrants, uh, guns. Those are all depressing to watch, like, like Melanie said. Uh, but it's the fact, though. Uh, he appeals to the lowest in instincts of people, and uh, and Robert uh, basically covered all those in the documentary. Uh, and he should have pushed back a little bit on uh, some of those pronouncements in those uh, in the documentary, but. Maybe there are limits. Maybe that's a protocol that you don't, you just relay the message and don't necessarily counter it like an interview. Uh, like he did not counter us also when he interviewed us. He let us have the conversation and he's trying to uh, portray the how how the actual scene is in in different places. You know, it seems this is this is sort of um, I don't know what to, how I want to describe it, but you know, we're talking about Biden, we're talking about Trump, but the problem goes so much deeper. It goes so much deeper. You know, we're just nibbling around the edges. When you stop to think about it, the 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 whole thing about the political parties, the, the two political parties, I mean, it's just it it's just got us all on hamstrings. And it really the political parties, 
I don't even think they really care who much who wins because they are all they all have these consultant jobs and money stuff. And, you know, it, it's it, it really isn't relevant to the lives of people, really. And I think really and truly this goes back to what Terry Link has been saying for years and years and years and years about the fact that we, besides having a, a, a bottom floor for people that so they could, can't fall below it, we should have had a ceiling where people couldn't go above it. Because I really do believe that what we're seeing is, is because of the huge wealth inequalities in all of the things that that has spawned including the fact that the Koch brothers have all these billions to invest in perverting the political process. You know, we, we what we have now, the biggest game in town is um, using money to either subvert the system, sometimes corrupt the system, but get the system to deliver what you want the system to deliver. And we like to say, OK, democracy is people power. But when we think about it, it's it's money power. And we're seeing it in all forms of institutions. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's public, private, not just corporate, not just corporate, public, private, nonprofit. Uh, and so it's, it's really about money. So you're absolutely correct. And I'm glad you brought that up, Melanie, because it is, we get so focused on the presidential election, we don't talk as much about the context, the context of America. And one of the things I'm really concerned about, based on my, my experience, and it's only speaking for me, uh, over the time I've been voting, which is considerable now, uh, is is the movement of not only the political parties more to the right, the, cons the, the conservatives are more conservative now. Goldwater was a shock to many in the 60s. Now I'm not sure he would be far right enough for the mainstream Republicans and the Democratic Party has moved more to the right. And most people would say that uh, Joe Biden is probably a centrist, but there there aren't any moderate Republicans anymore for the most part. Uh, and we've as a society have moved more to the right. And so issues of immigration and others, we hardly ever talk about poverty anymore. In fact, most of the political rhetoric is about helping the middle class. When you think about what it was like in the 60s, there was the war on poverty. Nobody left behind. No child left behind. The issues of making sure that we really embrace what a common wealth is. It's not about money, but it's about, you know, uh, everybody's votes rising and our obligations, our responsibilities versus a situation where it's all about me. It's what I can get. And it, it, it infiltrates everything. Uh, affirmative actions being uh, programs being dismantled. We shouldn't help people of color, DEI programs, diversity, equity, and inclusion, those being gotten rid of. Uh, those are just several examples of the Commonwealth ethic, which existed uh, you know, before, is still there. The spirit's there, and there are a number of us who embrace it. But what about society at large? I think since it's, it's uh, un unknowable what's going to transpire over the next 11 months, uh, that you don't put all your eggs in a basket. Uh, so I mean, we, I was at a, a, a facilitated statewide meeting, uh, earlier this morning. Um, and, and one of the elements we're talking about is the U S Senate race in Michigan. It's not a foregone conclusion who might win that even within either parties, uh, the Republicans now have about five, uh, candidates who have some name recognition and there's, it sounds like only two in the democratic side, but it's not a foregone conclusion, which of those two are necessarily going to win. So, uh, you know, the ability of our system of government to be able to hold some checks and balances will be uh, pretty, pretty essential. So if we put all our money and uh, energies into just electing a president and don't put any in uh, down down the line, we're, we're going to suffer, especially if we lose the presidency. Uh, so, I mean, we, we really need to think about those choices and invest some of our uh, skills, money, time, talent, uh, into making sure that the, the better choices, at least that we think that look to the Commonwealth and a Commonwealth that not is simply focused on the, on the U.S., but, uh, even as the, the theme, as you suggested that, that he brought to this film was that what happens in the U.S. affects the world, you know, climate change just being the example, but the, the, the current wars in, in multiple places, I mean, we're getting lots of information, uh, Gaza, 
and a little bit still on Ukraine. But I mean, there's lots of places that are under fire, a number of places in, in Africa, Venezuela and uh, uh, Guyana are about to break it. We have the issues now with Pakistan. Um, so there are things that can unwind for which we cannot even foresee how they will unwind. We just need to be able to situate ourselves to step in and take advantage of of, of some of those things. How to do that, I haven't a clue. Good good point, Stair. But you know, thinking about that back to the to the film and the fact that that, you know, what happens here is more important than than in the United States because of our outsized impact on the rest of the world beyond Britain really but but think about the people like in 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 Hungary and the places that have authoritarians already and how discouraging seeing that film might be to them to think that you know that this this whole wave of oppression across the world really that's why I really think we have to push back on on the narrative uh just for an example, so she called me the other day and she was talking and she says, I'm really disgusted. Biden's too old to run. <laughs> I had to really jump on her because, you know, it's not about age. My God, Trump is 77. We bought the narrative. If someone like her can buy the narrative because that's what's out there. That's what the news is is pushing. Um, we, we, we just can't let this happen. We've got to push back. I told her, don't you dare, don't you dare do that. Don't fall for that. I quite surprised her, I think, because I was a little vigorous. So what I felt was, um, in this documentary, they really wanted to sell the story that Trump is a real threat that's looming large. The documentary, the other focus group I was part of in CBS News, um, uh, and that I believe the focus was to to put the put the to present the danger that Biden could pose as a candidate, and they also came to gauge uh, Michigan voters where they stand. Uh, and one of the reasons I was probably selected was as um, Muslim American, what my if I could reflect on the position of our constituents, Muslim constituents. Uh, and I think they also were trying to get a read on Gretchen Whitmer as a potential candidate, either as a VP or as potential candidate uh, in place of Biden. And the other thing I would like to share is um, there was a tweet posted uh, with, the, with the focus group interview that I did. And initially, there was a lot of distasteful comments disparaging me for not wanting to vote for Biden. And then came the people who were saying, well, Biden is not listening to the people. And this is the last straw that we have, last card in our play, uh, in our hands to play. So Biden better, listen, Biden better listen to the people and not just act on his own. So that's how the trend seems to be right now. Um, and this would apply at, at all times in my life, but I think even more so now than ever before, at least as I perceive it. Uh, get active, do something. Uh, and activism can't be, I stay up on the news. Uh, I know what's going on around the country. That's great. That's super. But what it doesn't do is there's no external action from it other than conversations with family and friends. You've got to do something. And, and, and I'm not saying what to do. Uh, the three of you are great examples of people who have made decisions uh, about things that you're going to get involved in and support. And then you roll up your sleeves. You can roll up your sleeves in a million different ways, but you can't, you, you just can't sit down. You just can't watch TV news. You just can't read the newspapers uh, and, uh, you know, have something to say at cocktail parties. That's all important. I'm not disparaging that. What I'm saying, in, in because you may wake up um, and find out the, uh, what you had hoped and what your greatest fear has become reality. And so in many ways, I think, you know, fear is a great motivator to do something rather than fear being a, a reason to either be in denial or to be, be inactive. Um, you, you just, this is a time where, where people just have to step forward. Um, use your feet, uh, use whatever resource you have. Time is the most important one. Take a stand, uh, pick an issue or issues, uh, and it can't. And I think this goes back to what 
Melanie is saying it's just not, it's not a matter of just focusing on the candidates. Uh, it's much bigger than that, as she said, much deeper. Uh, why don't we uh, go around the uh, our panel here for any final comments that you'd like to make, and then we'll uh, bid our audience adieu and again thanking them for watching. It was an interesting experience uh, to go through uh, that discussion. It would have been even more interesting to have people who hold entirely different views in that discussion to be held in a respectful way to really maybe unearth something that we weren't able to unearth. Though I suspect that's the the realm of the 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 film was to do some of that itself. So they weren't just talking to us. Um, but I mean, it does highlight the. the that this is a cr pretty crucial time um, and th that uh, so much is uncertain uh, as things continue to change and things like big big climate events could make uh, immense uh, detours in any plans that anybody has for anything, let alone the things we're going on with wars, uh, and infectious disease. There's, you know, the rumblings of some new stuff uh, about to break loose and come get us. Um, you would just kind of hope that somehow in this, I think this goes to what Melanie was alluding to earlier. We need to build a, a a culture that shows this is all being connected and that we can't be separate and apart and think that we're going to have much of a future together. And those boundaries can't be political boundaries, um, whether they're nation states, county cities, um, whatever. So I'm, I'll, I'll leave it there. I appreciate the opportunity to be involved. To Frank's points uh, earlier, um, we got to do something. And one of the things I tell to friends in my circle, uh, particularly those who are disillusioned with uh, Biden's record on Gaza, is you cannot just sit out this election. You still got to vote. We worked hard to build the water base. Uh, and I tell them, you should not waste your vote. You should still go and vote. It needs to be counted. And I hope it will go for, a, for the right candidate. Uh, not one of these two. Uh, but it needs to be counted. So I appreciate the comments, both Terry and Tassin. And Frank, I think that little um, uh, lecture that you just gave about the importance of, of being active and doing things, that, that by itself would be a great thing to go viral because that's what people need to hear. But but it is about more than the candidates, and it's about us seeing that, that there's a whole lot of of rot in our system. And we, we can't look at, we, we're never going to have a perfect candidate. We're never, we're never going to have that, but we have to, and I wish it wasn't like this. I wish we could, you know, that there was one really, really good choice. Well, there is one really, really bad choice, <laughs> but, but we have to work for the best we can and to keep going. And it's going to take a lot of, 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 We'll probably never live to see, I wish that we'd live to see the pendulum swing back the way it was when we were younger, where, where liberal wasn't a bad word. And and there was that uh, amazing things that happened in the 50s and the 60s with the civil rights bill and, and all that that seems to be, you know, being so attacked in various ways. But I don't know. I, I'm really happy that there's people like y'all out there and that we we just have to keep working and we can't lose heart. And um, thanks for Frank for putting this together. And I'm glad we had the opportunity. Every time we talk, uh, it makes me think uh, and accentuate certain things. And one of the thoughts I had as you were talking uh, is that sometimes what we do is we think about politics with a capital P. And I think most of us do in terms of electoral politics. But we all know that there is a lowercase p, meaning there is politics in everything. And one of the, and I would say transformations, not changes, just changes. One of the biggest transformation is how the kinds of things we've been talking about today have infiltrated institutions and organizations of all kinds across sectors, churches, universities, you name it, nonprofit organizations, and some of these same struggles in terms of what's best for us versus what's what's our mission and how can we best um, achieve that mission gets sort of adulterated, so to speak, in terms of how can we beat uh, the competition and be number one. It's almost like a football game uh, being played across sectors. Uh, and people don't, one of the books I used to use years ago 
in my community development courses was a book entitled Putting People First. And, and back then, that seemed such a, like such a natural title. Putting people first, of course. There's, you're going to write a book on that. But that book is more valuable today, I think, because oftentimes we don't. We put the objectives first, the partisan objectives first, and then work back backwards and try to spin it out to people uh, why whatever's being marketed or sold is in their best interest. Well, it's in their best interest, but to be able to seal the deal, they've got to get you to buy in. And it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And so... Um, I think one of the great things about doing this is that people will watch the video eventually, come to their own conclusions about it. Um, and uh, uh, I think at the very least, <laughs> we've given people a, a lot of food for thought, maybe a lot of reasons to tweet at us <laughs> for what we've said. But thank you for being here today. And we hope the audience benefited from it in some way. And maybe we'll do this again. So take care, everyone.